Part 1. Here a tour guide speaking to a group of tourists who are visiting a part of New Zealand called Rotorua. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. In the exam, you would have 30 seconds to look at the questions. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello everyone and I'd like to welcome you all to Rotorua, one of the most famous destinations in New Zealand where we have a long history of welcoming visitors. I'd like to explain a bit about the geography of this amazing region, famous for its geothermal activity, and tell you what we've planned for your stay. Well, if you'd like to have a look at the map of the region that's in your welcome pack, if you find Lake Rotorua on the top left, the big triangular lake, we've just driven down along State Highway 5, SH5, down the western side of the lake, and then we turned off through the town. And we're here at the Lakes Motel, just around the southern tip of the lake. OK? Now tomorrow, we'll be heading off along SH30 in the opposite direction from the town, towards Lake Rotoita, where we'll be visiting the Hell's Gate Thermal Reserve, this is the area between the SH30 road and the lake, and I'll be telling you more about this in a minute. We'll then be returning to the motel, and in the afternoon, we'll be visiting the town of Rotorua itself, and also the Arts and Crafts Institute, which is just along the SH30 from the motel, where it meets the SH5 outside the town. Now, if you look directly out of the motel towards the southeast, in the opposite direction to Lake Rotorua, you can just see the peak of Mount Tarawera, and the day after tomorrow, we'll be visiting the volcanic valley which was formed when this last erupted. We'll drive down the SH5 and then head off towards Lake Rotamahana. The valley's on the opposite side of the lake from the mountain, so you can see what a powerful effect the eruption had. There's also an interesting archaeological site. A village buried by the same eruption on the western shores of Lake Tarawera, just to the north but I'm afraid we won't have time to visit that as a group, although you may wish to go there on your own. However, on the way back towards Rotorua along the SH5, we'll be stopping at Tamaki Village, which is on the main road about 12 kilometres outside town. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. So now let me tell you a bit more about these attractions. Just driving past the lake and through the town, I'm sure you've realised this is somewhere quite different from anywhere else in the world. So tomorrow, we'll start by visiting Hell's Gate Thermal Reserve. This is the most active area of the region volcanically and you'll see New Zealand's largest boiling whirlpool, where the water is actually 100 degrees centigrade, together with the largest hot waterfall in the Southern Hemisphere, where it's a more comfortable 40 degrees centigrade, just right for a hot shower. Entry is just $12 for adults and $6 for children. We'll come back to the motel for lunch, after which we'll visit the Arts and Crafts Institute, where you can learn about Maori people who lived here before the Europeans came. There's a display of Maori carving showing this traditional skill at its most impressive and exhibitions where you can learn about the use of geothermal waters for cooking food and for medicinal purposes. Entry is free and you'll find plenty to do there for the whole afternoon. The following day we'll be visiting another highlight of the region, the Volcanic Valley. This is a very new part of New Zealand. 
The valley was formed less than 150 years ago in 1886, when Mount Tarawera erupted violently, completely destroying the beautiful pink and white terraces that used to attract tourists to the region. After lunch, you can take a boat trip to see the volcanic activity at the edge of the lake. That's $25 for adults and $5 for children. We'll then be spending the afternoon learning more about traditional Maori life and pre-European New Zealand at Tamaki Village. As you walk around this recreated village, your Maori guide will tell you more about this traditional culture, and as the sun sets, you can enjoy a traditionally cooked feast known as the hangi, that's H-A-N-G-I, consisting of meat and vegetables cooked over hot stones, which are placed in a hole in the ground and covered with earth. And there's no extra charge for this, it's all included in the basic cost of your holiday. Now does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about employment interviews. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Today I have with me Sandy Richardson of the Local Workforce Center, and she'll be talking about that critical step towards the goal of employment, the interview. Sandy, what is an interview for, and what's the best way to approach it? A job interview is simply a meeting between you and a potential employer to discuss your qualifications and see if there is a fit. The employer wants to verify what they know about you and talk about your qualifications. If you have been called for an interview, you can assume that the employer is interested in you. The employer has a need that you may be able to meet, so it's your goal to identify that need and convince the employer that you're the one for the job. As everyone knows, interviews can be stressful, but when you're well prepared, there's no reason to panic. Preparation is the key to success in a job search, and you can begin by collecting together all the documents you may need for the interview, such as extra copies of your resume, lists of references, and letters of recommendation. You could also take some work samples, selecting from what you have designed, drawn, or written, for instance, and make sure you have a pen and pad of paper for taking notes. The next step is to find out about the post. The more you know about the job, the employer, and the industry, the better prepared you will be to target your qualifications. Always request a job description from the employer and research employer profiles at the Chamber of Commerce or local library. You could also try to network with people who work for the company or with employees of companies associated with it. The next step is to match your qualifications to the requirements of the job. A good approach is to write out your qualifications along with the job requirements. Think about some standard interview questions and how you might respond. Most questions are designed to find out more about you, your qualifications, or to test your reactions in a given situation. If you don't have any experience or skills in a required area, Think about how you might compensate for those deficiencies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. During an interview, it's important that you be yourself. Get a good night's sleep and plan your travel to be there in plenty of time so that you're not arriving out of breath with 30 seconds to spare. Don't, though, present yourself for the interview too early, 10 minutes at most. In the interview, listen carefully to each question asked. Take your time in responding and make sure your answers are positive. It's important to express a good attitude and show that you're willing to work, eager to learn, and are flexible. If you are unsure of a question, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. In fact, it's sometimes a good strategy to close a response with a question for the interviewer. In general, focus on your qualifications and look for opportunities to personalize the interview. Briefly answer questions with examples of how you responded in comparable situations from either your life or previous job experiences. Something you should avoid are yes or no responses to questions, but don't dwell too long on non-job related topics. Use caution if you are questioned about your salary requirements. The best strategy is to avoid the question until you have been offered a job. Questions about salary asked before there is a job offer are usually screening questions that may eliminate you from consideration, so be warned. On the other hand, it isn't inappropriate to show your enthusiasm if your first impressions of the interview and of the employer are good ones. So, if the job sounds like what you are looking for, say so. Keep in mind that the interview is not over when you are asked if you have any questions. Come prepared to ask a couple of specific questions that again show your knowledge and interest in the job. Close the interview in the same friendly, positive manner in which you started. When the interview is over, leave promptly. Don't overstay your time. Think about the interview and learn from the experience. Evaluate the success and failures. The more you learn from the interview, the easier the next one will become. You'll become much more confident. To close, here are a few more tips. First, maintain good eye contact throughout the interview and be aware of nonverbal body language. Second, dress a step above what you would wear on the job. Go to the hairdressers, have a shave, etc. Remember that your appearance is a key indicator of whether you have the right attitude, so it can pay to give some thought to how you look. And finally, don't be a clock watcher. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and some students talking about an assignment. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Come in. Sit down. Good to see you. Hello. Hello. Now, this assignment. The best thing we can do, I think, is to think how we can approach it. The main point is to investigate television, but not what's happened in the past. I was thinking that it would be necessary to go over the new media first hmm. and then... Yes, that's a way to make a start. But you need to do that quite briefly. But it's quite a complex topic. That... Yeah, I agree, but the emphasis must be on the future development of television as a cultural phenomenon. Yes. 
I've been reading the talk by Ashley Highfield. All right, and what do you take from that? What are the things that are competing with television? Well, to start with, there is the games console, then there is the personal computer and the internet. Um, then again, the mobile phone with its capability of games and puzzles,、mm. um, and of course, internet access. Lastly, there is the iPod with the possibility of listening to music wherever you go. Good, you've understood that. Now, which of these presents the greatest competition for television? Well, according to the research, it's video games. Yes, that's true at present. But in the future, I think the phone will present the greatest threat then. And why? Because it's mobile, portable, and it's developing fast. Yeah, I think you're right. You need always to look to the future and try to assess how things will develop, as we said. Good. Now you need to move on to the new social trends in connection with television. Is one of them the idea that programs might become shorter and shorter? Ah, yes. The, the average program might be ten minutes, or even less. Just mini programs, say four to five minutes long. Now. Do you think you can get access to all the materials you need? The problem at the moment is the library. Oh yes, what's happening there? There's a tremendous amount of noise because of the new extension they are building. It's quite impossible to work there. They are stopping work for a week next week, I believe, and then all the sections will be open. There's a hold-up because some roof tiles have not arrived, so there'll be peace for that week. But then after that, the media studies section will be closed for a week, and all the noise and dirt will start up again. Yes, the sociology section will be open, and there's some good stuff there for you on this topic, and it's further away from the noise.、Mm. Yes, I don't think the sociology section is affected at all, and neither is the journal section. No, obviously they're rotating the closures, and it was sociology's turn to close for a week last term. I think we should make a complaint. Yes, I think you should. I've had a word with the library staff. They are very sympathetic, but well, they are affected by these works just as we are. If I were you, I'd make a complaint directly to the premises committee. They only meet once a year, but in fact, I know they're having a meeting next Tuesday. You might like to make contact with them, but don't say that I suggested this. <laughs> yes, but the students' union might be better since they are independent of the university. That's true, but I can imagine that people haven't already approached them about this.、Mm. Uh, let's try the premises committee. Good idea. Why not? Okay. Now, don't forget, I need a copy of your dissertations by email and two copies in print. That is on paper. If you give the reprographics office twenty-four hours' notice, they'll make copies for you. And if you give them my details, they'll send those copies directly to me. They won't send copies to you, so you'll need to take your own copy personally from them. Good. Any questions? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. One little thing was just that I wondered whether we should actually talk about that famous website, you know the one YouTube. Ah, I was rather hoping you hadn't overlooked that. <sighs> Good point. It's mostly homemade videos. I suppose you could say that each video is a television version of a podcast. Anything else? Yes, I've got a question. I'm afraid, I'm not completely clear about the exact meaning of culture. As we are using it in this subject. Well, Mrs. Jones is giving a lecture on culture and society in the University Theatre. It's on Wednesday at 10 a.m., and you can learn all about it there. I'm sure. Can you give us that again, please? Yes, that's culture and society. It's in the University Theatre, and、um, let me just check the time. Yes, here it is, 10 a.m. on Wednesday. She'll be giving a very thorough discussion of the issues in defining what culture means. Right. That's good.、Uh, the thing is, the reading list confused me a bit. One thing that occurred to me was that it might be broken down into subsections for future students. Yes, that's a fair point. I'll bear that in mind. Now, don't forget, you need to do the reading and finish the assignment by the fourth of July. Is that okay? Fine. Thank you very much.
That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Now listen to the second part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Many typically American characteristics: individualism, self-reliance, informality, punctuality, and directness are a result of those values mentioned earlier. Other national traits could also be identified, however. One, Americans cooperate. Although often competitive, Americans also have a good sense of teamwork and cooperate with others to achieve a goal. Two. Americans are friendly, but in their own way. In general, friendships among Americans tend to be shorter and more casual than friendships among people from other cultures. This has something to do with American mobility. And the fact that Americans do not like to be dependent on other people, Americans also tend to compartmentalize friendships, having friends at work, family friends, friends on the softball team, etc. Three, Americans ask a lot of questions, some of which may to you seem pointless, uninformed, or elementary. Someone you have just met may ask you very personal questions. No impertinence is intended. The questions usually grow out of a genuine interest. Four, Americans tend to be internationally naive. Many Americans are not very knowledgeable about international geography or world affairs. They may ask uninformed questions about current events and may display ignorance of world geography. Because the U.S. is not surrounded by many other nations. Some Americans tend to ignore the world. Five. Silence makes Americans nervous. Americans are not comfortable with silence. They would rather talk about the weather than deal with silence in a conversation. Six. Americans are open and usually eager to explain. If you do not understand certain behavior or want to know what makes Americans tick. Do not hesitate to ask questions. Just as values and traits differ somewhat from one culture to another, so do the personal habits associated with good manners and courtesy. While very often there does not seem to be any particular reason why a particular way of doing something is considered good manners, observing these cultural rules will make Americans more comfortable with you, and therefore you with them. It is, of course. Impossible to cover all the possibilities here. If you are unsure in a situation, just ask. Americans like to be helpful. One, queuing up or lining up is essential. Courtesy requires that you do not push from behind, stand next to the person being helped, or cut into a line. If you should accidentally bump someone, you should say, "Excuse me." Two. Americans blow their noses into a tissue. Spitting, clearing phlegm, or sniffing as from a cold are considered rude. Three, it is considered poor manners to slurp, 
chew noisily, or open your mouth while chewing. 4. Questions are seen as a good way of getting acquainted, but questions about a person's age, financial affairs, cost of clothing or personal belongings, religious affiliations and sex life are considered too personal for questioning, except between very close friends. 5. Men generally do not hold hands or link arms in public with other men. This is somewhat more acceptable between women and quite common between men and women. Now, a few words about personal safety. Unfortunately, in the US, one must be aware of crimes. It is wise to be especially careful until you are familiar with the community in which you live. Remember that good judgment and common sense can significantly reduce chances of having an unpleasant and perhaps harmful experience. Basic safety rules include the following. 1. Do not walk alone at night. 2. When you leave your room, apartment or automobile, make sure that all doors are locked and all windows are secured. 3. Do not carry too much cash or wear jewellery of great value. 4. Never accept a ride from a stranger. Do not hitchhike and do not pick up hitchhikers. 5. Be careful of purses and wallets, especially in crowded metropolitan areas where there may be purse snatchers and pickpockets. 6. If a robber threatens you, at home or on the street, try not to resist unless you feel that your life is in danger and you must fight or run away. Give up your valuables as calmly as you can and observe as much as possible about the robber to tell the police when you report the crime. A final note. Keep an open mind. Don't judge what you see as right or wrong but make it a challenge to try to understand the variety of American behaviours which you may observe. You certainly do not have to participate in something you disagree with, but you can try to understand it. This will help you build an attitude of intelligent and liberated respect for cultures, both your own and others. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.